Hi everyone, and you're very welcome to today's Saturday session, which is on Liebenser biology, and the topic for today is going to be ecology. So we're going to look at the main content around the topic of ecology, and throughout we're also going to look at some exam questions as well, just so we can see how we can relate the content to the exam questions and making sure we're picking up as many marks as we possibly can in preparation for our exams. So before we get into it, we're going to talk about the definition of ecology. So ecology is the study of the way living things and their environment both work together and interact with each other. And any external factor is referred to as the environment. So one key word which would be very common to you is the idea of a habitat. So a habitat is a place where an organism lives. And there's lots of different examples of this. We can have deserts, we can have meadows, we can have grasslands, we can have woodlands. As part of your ecology study, you would have done a habitat study. Um, more often than not, that's to a grassland or a woodland, but differs from school to school. So you would have got a real sense of what's actually involved in a habitat and the different features that make up that habitat. So another word that's used quite often with the idea of a habitat is an ecosystem. So an ecosystem is a place where all living organisms work together and with their surrounding environment. So where the habitat is the place where the organism lives, the ecosystem describes the interrelationships between the living organisms and the non-living environment. So remember the environment refers to all the external factors. So that could be something like the weather. Okay, so different ecosystems might have different weather patterns or different climates within them. So a couple of different examples of ecosystems here. So one example being the desert. A feature that a desert would have would be that it has very low rainfall. And a sample of that would be the Sahara Desert. You could also have a desert like the Gobi Desert. Another ecosystem would be the grasslands. So one feature of this is the mild temperatures and the low rainfall. An example of that would be the steppes of Asia. And then a third ecosystem would be the freshwater ecosystems. One feature that they would have would be having non-salty water. And rivers, lakes and wetlands will be an example of a freshwater ecosystem. Now we mentioned a couple of times already about the environment being all of the external factors. So these environmental factors, there's four categories of factors that can affect the ecosystems. So abiotic factors are the non-living factors. The biotic factors are the living factors. The climatic factors are the average weather conditions. So anything associated with weather would fall underneath the branch of climatic factors. And then edaphic factors refers to the soil. So within that, we could be talking about things like soil temperature. We could have soil pH or we could have soil moisture, so water content within the soil. So once we refer to a daphic, we're relating to anything to do with the soil. So here's a table made up of all the living and non-living parts of our ecosystem. So the living things that affect the ecosystems are called the biotic factors, and then the non-living things which affect the ecosystem are called the abiotic factors. So a couple of biotic factors that we have there, we could have competition and predation. So we all know that animals compete for food and mates, but plants will also compete for space and for light. So there's competition happening all the time within our ecosystems. Predation, so this is where a predator, which is an animal that kills and eats another organism, hunts prey, where the prey is the animal that's eaten by the predator. So this is going to control the number of organisms that we would have in ecosystems. So the more predators that we have, they're going to eat large amounts of prey, so the number of prey could fall. But if we didn't have large numbers of prey for the predators to eat, then the number of predators could fall. And we'll have a look at that a little bit later on. So some of the abiotic factors or non-living factors, we have our weather and we have our soil. So climatic factors for weather and daphic factors for soil. So within weather, the temperature and light can affect photosynthesis. So the more sunlight, the more photosynthesis will occur. And climate can also influence the migration of organisms on Earth. So there will be some species who would move to more warmer conditions at certain times of the year. Some might prefer some colder conditions, so they will migrate across the Earth. On the soil, soil can impact the type of plants that can grow. So some plants are going to prefer more acidic soils, other plants are going to prefer drier soils. So again, relating back to the term edaphic, it's anything to do with the soil. So we're going to have a look at a couple of the climatic factors. So again, this is an abiotic factor because it's non-living and it's affecting the ecosystem. So an abiotic factor. And these are the elements of the climate or weather that influence the life and distribution of the organisms that live in a particular environment. So some examples of climatic factors will be the temperature, rainfall, wind, and also humidity, so the moisture content in the air. So if we have a look at temperature, first of all, temperature can affect the rate of reactions in living things. So higher temperatures in summer increases plant growth, but lower temperatures can lead to animals such as hedgehogs and frogs hibernating in winter. 
so their metabolism slows down, they're not going to be as active in winter. Rainfall, but we know water is essential for life, so plants such as cacti are adapted, are adapted to store as much water as possible, because again, these can be found in desert ecosystems where uh, low rainfall is very, very common. So being adapted to source or to, to store water is really important for them. And then wind, well, wind can cause physical damage and also increases evaporation, or it can increase transpiration within plants, evaporation of water off the ground for animals. And we can see here that trees exposed to wind grow better on the sheltered side and bend away from the wind. That's because they're not as exposed. And wind can also help spread pollen and seeds so plants can grow in places they may not have before. So really important for increasing the number of the plants as well through asexual reproduction. So the adaptive factors, we've already mentioned that this refers to anything to do with the soil. And these are the physical, chemical and biological characteristics of the soil that influence the community. So these can include the soil type, the soil pH, air and mineral content or the soil texture. So if we have a look at the table down here, we can see one factor that affects ecosystems is the soil pH. Okay, so how acidic or how basic the soil is. So plants and animals are adapted to specific pHs. So acidic soils would generally be more suited to bog moss and heather, whereas neutral soils would suit most of the plants. Basic soils would suit plants such as bee orchids. So some plants would be more suited to different pHs than others. The water content is also really important. So water is absorbed by the roots. Again, this is used for photosynthesis. So plants need water for photosynthesis and also for their general metabolism as well. And a lack of water can lead to wilting. Mineral content is also really important. So this is needed by plants for growth and a lack of any mineral can result in stunted growth for the plant. So the soil pH, water content and mineral content are three of the adaptive factors or factors relating to the soil that it can affect ecosystems. So we're going to look a little bit now at energy flow throughout the ecosystem. Energy will flow throughout the ecosystem as all of the organisms feed. So we mentioned a couple of minutes ago about how we can have predators and prey. So a predator being an organism that catches and kills another organism. And as it feeds, it's going to get some energy from what it's eaten. Okay, so the energy is going to flow as organisms feed. Organisms that make their own food are called producers. So we know plants make their own food through the process of photosynthesis. So they're known as producers because they produce their own food. Whereas organisms that eat other organisms are called consumers. Okay, so we will be an example of a consumer because we don't produce our own food. We have to catch or we have to get food from other sources, okay, other organisms. So we can see here, we're going to be looking at this food chain in a couple of minutes, but we can see the energy has been passed from organism to organism. So where the arrow is pointing to is, is to the organism that's doing the eating or the feeding. So the caterpillar is eating the leaf, the chameleon is eating the caterpillar, the snake is eating the chameleon, and the mongoose is eating the snake. So we're going to have a look at the food chains now in a second. Before we do that though, we're going to just have a look at the organisms that exist within the habitats. So we mentioned a couple of minutes ago there about the producer being the organism that makes their own food. Okay, an example of that being green plants. So we obviously can't make our own food. Following on from that, we're going to have our first consumer. Okay, a lot of the time we could be the first consumer, so we're known as the primary consumer. Okay, so this is the first consumer, they eat the producer. This can be anything. In general, we're going to look at an example here in terms of rabbits and green flies, so they would eat the green plant. Now the secondary consumer is going to come next, and the secondary consumer is the one that eats the primary consumer. It eats the previous level. So these are the second consumer. Some examples related to the examples we just seen there a second ago would be the foxes, which could eat the rabbit, which ate the green plant, or we could have our ladybird, which eats the green fly, which also ate the green plant. Then we have our tertiary consumer. So our tertiary consumer is generally our top consumer. So we generally wouldn't go back or go any further than a tertiary consumer. We'll explain why in a couple of minutes, but they're going to eat the secondary consumer. Okay, so again, eating the level before, and an example of that being the sparrow hawk. Now we get to why we don't generally go above a tertiary consumer in a couple of minutes, but it's to do with the energy levels. So lots of energy is lost as these organisms feed. So as the primary consumer eats the producer, it gets some energy, but most of it's going to be lost. That energy then that the primary consumer has, the secondary consumer is going to get some of that by eating the primary consumer. But again, a lot of it is going to be lost. But we come to that in a couple of minutes. So just one note, the consumers here can either be carnivores, which means they eat meat, or they can be herbivores, which means they eat plants, or they can be omnivores, which means they eat both. Okay, so 
the primary consumer here that eats the producer. If it only eats plants, then it's going to be a herbivore. The secondary consumer here, it could be a carnivore, meaning it only eats meat, but it also could be an omnivore, meaning it eats both meat and plants. Now, we've already mentioned the idea of a food chain. We've seen this example in a couple of slides ago, but a food chain shows the feeding relationship that exists between organisms in a habitat. So we've already mentioned the arrows will point towards the organism that does the consuming. So the leaf in this case is eaten by the caterpillar, which is then eaten by the chameleon, which is then eaten by the snake, which is then eaten by a mongoose. So this example looks a little bit different. It was just fitted in to the space that we had, but generally it would just be a continuous line. So after the chameleon, we continue on to snake and then continue on to mongoose again. It was just brought down to fit into the space. So they usually will start with a plant, which is the producer. They produce their own food and then they are going to be consumed by the consumers. So we have our primary consumer, our secondary consumer, our tertiary consumer, and we also actually have a fourth consumer in this one, but that won't always happen. Usually a tertiary consumer might be as far as we get. So there's a couple more examples of food chains we have here. So we have leaves, which is primary consumer, or sorry, primary producer again, is gonna be eaten by the caterpillar, which is gonna be eaten by the trush. So if you're to write in what each one of those are, that's the producer, our primary producer. This is gonna be our primary consumer. And this is going to be our secondary consumer. So the next one is going to be very, very similar. We were a producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer. This will be our tertiary consumer over here. So that's the one that's different from the previous one. We actually do have a tertiary consumer. And this will be our fourth consumer over here. But again, won't always get as far as that. Now, a food web, on the other hand, very similar to a food chain, except a food web is made up of interconnected food chains. So lots of food chains intermingled with each other. So if we were to look at the entire food web down here, we can actually pick out some individual food chains. So we have our plant here, primary producer, eaten by the giraffe, eaten by the lion. So primary consumer, secondary consumer. Same thing if we start off with the tree, we have our rhino, primary consumer, eaten by the lion, secondary consumer. If we go over here, we have our plant, eaten by a grasshopper, eaten by our bird, eaten by our skunk, eaten by our, our hawk, okay, or our vulture. So it doesn't matter where we start, we can see that we can pick out individual food chains. Okay? And what this shows us is that the food web shows us that all organisms are reliant on each other for survival. So here's another example of a food web. This time we don't actually have any pictures, it's just words, but it's the exact same idea here. We have our leaf, which is our primary producer, eaten by greenfly, eaten by ladybird, eaten by blackbird, eaten by sparrowhawk. That same leaf could be eaten by an earthworm, eaten by a hedgehog, which is then eaten by a fox. Or the same leaf again could be eaten by a snail, which is then eaten by a hedgehog, which is then eaten by a fox. So we can see competition really easily within these food webs as well. Because if we have a look here, the earthworm, the snail, the mouse, the rabbit, the caterpillar, and the green fly are all eating the leaves, okay? Which should be in plentiful supply. But if we go up here to the top, we can see that both the sparrow hawk and the stoat eat the mouse. So they're going to be in competition for the mouse because both of them are going to want to use it as their food source, okay? So the stoat obviously can eat the rabbits as well. The sparrow hawk can also eat the blackbird. But if they were both reliant on the mouse, they will be in big competition with each other to try and get that food source for themselves. Now, we've already mentioned this briefly already, but we're going to have a look at energy flow throughout the ecosystem as well. So energy will flow throughout the ecosystem as the organisms feed. OK, so we can see over here on the right hand side, we have our producer. It's going to be eaten by the primary consumer, which is going to be eaten by the secondary consumer. Now, when the primary consumer eats producer, it's going to gain some energy from eating the producer. And when the secondary consumer eats the primary consumer, it's again going to pick up some energy from that food source. But the majority of the energy is going to be lost through heat energy. And roughly 90% of all energy will be lost as we move from the bottom of a food chain right up to the top of a food chain. So that's why we said a couple of minutes ago that normally the tertiary consumer would be the top consumer. So we'd have one more level up here because after that there's very, very little energy left over. So the tertiary is usually the top consumer. So we're going to have a look at a quick exam question now based off of this and we can see the first one there. A typical grazing food chain consisting of four trophic levels is shown below. Each letter represents a different species. So A is eaten by B, is eaten by C, is eaten by D and we know that because the arrowhead is pointing towards B and then C and then D. So the first question there says explain what is meant by the term trophic level and we know that this is the feeding position or positioning on a feeding chain. So feeding chain position.
we'll have a look at the next one. It says, why are food chains generally short? Well, we mentioned that a couple of minutes ago. An awful lot of energy is lost as we move from level to level. So by the time we get towards the top, there's very little energy left. So this is because of the low energy or little energy passed to the next level. And we could mention something there about 90% being lost. Okay, so we'll give a figure just so we know our statistics. 90% being lost. Part three. It says, which letter represents the secondary consumer? So we know the first one is going to be the producer. Second one is the primary consumer. Third one is the secondary consumer. So that's going to be C. Part four. Give a possible reason why the population of C may decline naturally. Well, one way that this could happen is because of predation. And more specifically, we could say that there's an increase in D. Okay, so we know that C is eaten by D. So if the numbers of D increase, there's going to be more of those to eat C. So the numbers of C are going to fall. Part four, or sorry, part five. Suggest the possible consequence for the population of A if the population of C was significantly reduced. So population of A would probably fall. And the reason for that is because the number of C, which are available to each B, has reduced. So in turn, the number of B is going to increase, which means more of A is going to, to be eaten or to be consumed which means that the population of A is going to fall. Okay, so we have to say suggest how members, um, sorry, suggest the possible explanation we had to explain. So we're going to say population will fall. That's because a decrease in C, that's an increase in B. So more of A is eaten or more of A is consumed. Okay, so that was part five. Part six, I'll try and I'll actually go up to the top here for part six, just so we don't run out of space. Part six, suggest how members of species D might respond if the population of C was significantly reduced. Well, one way, if they didn't have a food source, they're probably just going to migrate and go and find a food source somewhere else. So migration, or if they could, they're going to switch their prey. So maybe they have something else that they can eat. So they'll just eat that to get their energy instead of focusing on the one that's after been significantly reduced. And part seven, a food web is a series of interconnected food chains. Suggest how it may be possible for the secondary consumer. So the secondary consumer up here is C. Explain how it's possible for the secondary consumer in the food chain above to be a primary consumer in another food chain. So if it's a secondary consumer here, it's eaten an organism, which is most likely an animal for B. But if it was, if it was in the position of B, it would have to be a plant. So in that case, it would have to be an omnivore. Okay, so it eats plants and animals. So it can be a primary consumer in the other food chain because it eats plants, but here it's the secondary consumer because it's going to eat the animals. Okay, so we're going to have a look at the trophic level now. We mentioned it briefly in the last um, exam question anyway, but we'll go into it in more detail here. So the trophic level refers to the position of an organism in a food chain. Now, we've already mentioned these already. We have a primary um, consumer, we have a secondary consumer, we have a producer at the start, tertiary consumer. We can go up towards the top, have our fourth consumers and so on. So the first trophic level is going to be the plants or is going to be the producers. The second trophic level is going to be where the primary consumers are. The third trophic level is going to be where the secondary consumers are. And the fourth trophic level is going to be where the tertiary consumers are. So we've mentioned this already. So we can see there we have our producers, primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary consumers. So it's our first level, our second, our third, and our fourth. So it's just important to know that they're sometimes referred to as T1, T2, T3, and T4. Now, a pyramid of numbers then, this is another concept which we look at in ecology, and we can see here it's very similar to a diagram we looked at a couple of minutes ago when we were referring to the amount of energy that was being passed on from level to level. So if we just relate it back to the energy diagram, we had a large amount of energy at the, top, at the bottom and a smaller amount of energy um, exists right up until the top. That's what a standard pyramid of numbers would normally look like as well. So we would have a large number of producers at the bottom, a smaller number of primary consumers, smaller number again of secondary consumers, and then a smaller number again of tertiary consumers. It's not always going to look like that, and we'll see in examples in a couple of minutes, but a standard pyramid of numbers would somewhat resemble that. Now, what is a pyramid of numbers? What does it actually do? Well, a pyramid of numbers represents the number of organisms at each trophic level. So because the producer section here of the pyramid of numbers is the largest, the largest bar, 
that means it has the largest number of organisms. The primary consumers has slightly less, but it's still larger than the secondary consumers, which is still larger than the tertiary consumers. Now, generally, the number of each organism at each level is going to decrease as you move up. Not always the case, and we'll see examples in a couple of minutes. But the reason for this is because of the high level of energy loss from level to level. So here's the standard pyramid of numbers. We can see at the bottom we have our producers, which are the plants. We have a certain number of those quite abundant because they're plants. Even less primary consumers, which are the snails. Even less secondary consumers, which are the frogs. And then even less tertiary consumers, which in this case is a fox. So the number of organisms in this case is represented by the bars and the width of the bars. And as we go from the bottom to the top, it gets smaller and smaller. Now, a pyramid of numbers does not always have a regular pyramid shape because it does not take into account of the biomass of the organisms. So what do we mean by that? Well, down here we have one oak tree, so one organism. That means we have a narrow bar. But that one oak tree can feed thousands of insects. So that's why this bar up here is much bigger. So even though we only have one oak tree, it can sustain thousands of organisms. So an inverted pyramid of numbers can be found in an ecosystem where the community contains a few producers with very large biomass that support a larger number of smaller consumers. So we can see this one here is inverted, doesn't follow the standard pyramid shape, which I said a couple of minutes ago could happen. Now, an inverted pyramid of numbers can also be found in an ecosystem where the community contains parasites. So a parasite is something that lives off another living organism, and we can see that in the pyramid of numbers over on the right-hand side. So the plants, we've quite a large bar there because we've quite a number of plants in this ecosystem. Those plants, even though there's quite a number of them, will probably only sustain one red deer. So they need lots of plants for their food source, but then that one deer can sustain many deer ticks. Okay, so they're parasites, many of those can survive on the one deer. So there can be many more parasites than the hosts they feed on because each individual parasite has a very small biomass. So because they're so small, one deer is enough to host many, many of those. Now the shape of the pyramid of numbers does not change the shape of the pyramid of energy. So for any food chain, producers store the most energy and the energy stored decreases at each level given a regular pyramid of energy. So even though down here we might have an inverted pyramid of numbers, over here the pyramid of energy is the exact same shape. So we're still losing up to 90% of the energy as we go from level to level. So here's another exam question. So it says draw a pyramid of numbers to represent the information in the food chain below. So we've one rose bush, so that's going to be quite a small bar, can sustain many caterpillars, so that's going to be a larger bar. We'll have even less blackbirds and we'll have even smaller hawk. Okay, so that's going to be an inverted pyramid of numbers for part one. For part two, what term is used to describe the organisms at the top of the food chain? They're going to be the top or the tertiary consumers. And then for part three, explain why pyramid of numbers are usually restricted to three or four levels. We've seen this before. It's because of the large energy loss from level to level. So another exam question here, where in a food chain are primary producers found? That's normally the first level. What term is used to describe organisms that feed on primary producers? That's our primary consumers. Why are most food chains um, short, so it only consists of a few trophic levels? So that's because of the large energy loss again. So we can see there that's a very common exam question. What deduction may be made if the organisms at the start of the chain are less numerous than those that feed upon them? So what does this mean about our producer? That means they most likely have a large biomass. So that was in the inverted pyramid of numbers we've seen a couple of minutes ago about how one producer could feed many, many organisms. Can a parasite be the first member of the food chain? The answer for that is no. And the reason for that is because parasites are not producers. Or you could say there that they need a living host. Okay, so they're not producers. They don't uh, produce their own food. They need to feed on something else. So energy um, enters food chains in the form of light. In which form do you think more, most energy is lost from food chains? So we mentioned that already in the pyramid of numbers. That's true heat energy. We're now going to have a look at the habitat study, which is something you might have done already as part of your leaving biology studies. But if not, you will. Okay, so you will come across all of this information at some point anyway. So we've already mentioned this already, but ecology is the study of the way living things and their environment both work together and interact with each other. And your habitat study is where you really would have started to investigate that. 
You mentioned already about a habitat and where a habitat is a place where an organism, organism lives. So some of the examples included deserts, meadows, woodlands and grasslands. And most likely the habitat you would have studied was either a woodland or a grassland. And you would have looked at the features of those within that. Now, within the habitat study, you would have used many pieces of equipment so that you could capture and identify different animals and plants. So some of them are listed, listed here. We have our quadrat, we have our sweep net, we have a pitfall trap, and we also have a pooter. So the quadrat, we can see there is a square shape. This is randomly placed on the ground. So normally, if you're randomly placed on the ground, you would have stood with a pencil, threw the pencil over your shoulder, and then placed the quadrat on top of where the pencil went. We're obviously not gonna throw the entire quadrat because it's just too heavy and could cause injury to somebody. So what you will do then is you'll go to where the quadrat is, examine the inside the square frame, and the number and species of each plant and animal will be recorded using a key. The sweep net does exactly what it says. You sweep long grass so you can collect small insects by brushing it through long grass or tree leaves. And then a key again is gonna be used to identify the organisms. A pitfall trap is kind of hard to see there, but there is a trap set into the ground there. So a small hole is dug into the ground. A cover is placed on top, ensuring it is raised so that small animals and insects can crawl under. And when they do, they will fall into the cup or the trap that you've set. Once it's covered with plants and stones, they won't be able to see it and fall in. And small animals and insects will fall in. And you can then, once again, identify them with a key. And the pooter, this is used to collect small animals. So one tube is placed on or near the insect. So that's the one that has... Um, no gauze on it. The other tube can then be used to suck the insect into the collection jar. So just make sure you're putting the one that has no gauze at the end over the insect and the one that has the gauze is, um, is the one that you suck through. Now we've mentioned this already but when we collect our plants and animals how do we identify them? So we do that with a key. So a key can look like over here on the, on the left, on the, sorry on the right hand side. So we can see here this was to identify some plants. Very very similar ones which you might have used to identify animals as well but a key is used to identify your plants and animals as part of your habitat study. Now, when you were doing your habitat study, you would have done two types. You would have done a qualitative study and you would also have done a quantitative study. So the qualitative study is any data that you would have collected using words. So more often than not, it was just a yes or no. Are they present or not? And what's the name of the organism? What's the plant? What's the animal? You're not actually counting them, you're just saying they're present or they're not present, and you're given the name by identifying them. The quantitative study, then, on the, other time, on the other hand, uses numbers. So you're counting the frequency. How many of them were there? What percentage of the entire habitat was covered by this particular plant? So that's anything to do with numbers. Now, one quantitative study you would have done was to calculate the percentage frequency of an organism, and you most likely would have done this with the quadrat as well. So the percentage frequency gives an estimation of the chance that you would find a specific species by randomly throwing a quadrat in a habitat. And to calculate the percentage frequency, we find the number of throws of the quadrat that the organism was present in, divided by the total number of throws, and then times that by 100 to change to a percentage. And we're going to see that in action now in a second. So there's one example already done there for us. So we can see this particular habitat study, there was a woodlouse present. And on the first throw, second, third, fourth, fifth, and the ninth throw, the woodlouse was present, but there was four throws where it wasn't. So in total, there was six throws where it was present. The frequency is six out of 10 because it was 10 throws, and times six out of 10 by 100, and we get 60%. So let's say we had grass it was present on nine of the throws. So a total of nine, which means the frequency is nine tenth, times that by 100, and we get 90%. And it doesn't matter which organism you're doing this for, it's the exact same steps. Find the frequency, multiply it by 100, and you found the percentage frequency. So we have a 60% chance of getting a woodlouse on the next row, and a 90% chance of getting grass on the next row. Percentage cover is slightly different then. This is an estimation as to what percentage of a habitat an organism takes up. And it's normally calculated for plants. So what percentage of the entire habitat does grass take up? What percentage of the entire habitat do daisies take up? Whatever the particular plant is. So percentage cover is calculated as follows. It's the total number of small squares an organism is present in. So within our quadrat, we know it's square shaped, but normally that's divided up into a series of smaller squares. Normally it's going to be 25. You're gonna count the number of smaller squares it's, it's present in, divide that by the total number of small squares we have in total, times that by 100, and we will have our percentage cover. So an example here is already done for grass. We could do the exact same thing there for a daisy. So if it was present on 10 throws, it 
So we'll add up all those numbers now. So 45, 55, 70, 110, 120, 130, 140. So it's present in 140 small squares. The total number of small squares was 250. And then all you have to do is put 140 divided by 250 into your calculator, times that by 100, and we will get 56%. So in this case, 56% of the entire habitat was covered with daisies. And again, it doesn't matter which organism you're looking at, will be a plant for the most part. Um, you can do it obviously for animals as well, but it becomes a little bit more difficult, but it's more accurate and um, more appropriate to do so for plants. So there is some potential sources of error as we're carrying out our habitat study as well. So there is human error, which we can make. There can be changing conditions. So if you're doing a habitat study today and then next week, if there's been particularly bad weather, some of the organisms might have retreated or gone underground. So it would have made your results slightly different. You might have an accidental discovery. So there might be an organism present that day that shouldn't actually be there, just a complete accident. And also your sample size as well. So if you carry off a one-off um, habitat study today and don't repeat that ever again, you can take those results um, as absolutely valid and absolutely representative of the entire habitat. You would have to do the same habitat study at many different times, uh, at many different stages throughout the year to get a better picture of what's actually contained within the habitat. So just a little bit more detail about the potential sources of error. So where do we get human error? Well, it's possible to make simple errors when you're recording the data. You might be able to interpret the key 100% accurately. And also when you're performing calculations, you might make a little error as well. Change of conditions, we've already mentioned. The accidental discovery there, it says it is possible that accidental discoveries be made, so a rare organism may be present on a particular day. And then as we mentioned there about the sample size as well, the larger the number of habitats that are studied within an ecosystem, the more accurate the findings are going to be. So another exam question here, answer the following questions in relation to a quantitative survey of a species of small herbaceous plant. So name the method you would employ. So we're going to calculate percentage cover, and we're going to use a quadra for that. How would you ensure that your sampling was random? So we're going to throw a pencil over our shoulder. And we'll place the quadra on top of that. And then the last one there, name one edaphic factor that could affect the distribution of this plant in the ecosystem. So we mentioned earlier on about edaphic factors referring to the soil. So a couple of those, you could have soil pH, you could have soil temperature, you could have soil, tem um, sorry, soil um, moisture content or water content, or even the soil type. So type of soil there as well. So lots of different answers which you could put in, but they were looking for an edaphic factor, so it had to be something relating to the soil. Now for the last couple of slides, we're going to look at adaptations, competition, interdependence, and so on. So an adaptation is when an organism develops certain characteristics that make it more suited to the environment that it lives in. It normally happens as a result of evolution, and there are two main types of adaptations we can have. We can have physical adaptations and behavioral adaptations. Now a couple of examples of adaptations which you might be familiar with. Polar bear has a physical adaptation, a buffalo has a behavioral adaptation, and squirrels also have behavioral adaptations as well. So the polar bear, the physical one they have, they have white fur to protect or camouflage them from their prey. And they also have thick layers of fat to keep them warm. So they also live in, um, in very cold conditions. So those thick layers of fat will make sure they stay warm. Buffalo are behavioral. So buffalo will migrate to areas with better weather, better breeding conditions, and that has more food at certain times of the year. So that's why you'll see these really famous images of the mass migration of the buffalo from one area to another. So they're moving because they want better weather, better breeding conditions, and more food. Squirrels also have a behavioral adaptation. So squirrels will hibernate. You've probably heard of that before. So they enter a deep sleep to save their energy over winter where they would find it hard to get food. Okay, so their metabolism is much, much lower. They don't need as much food because they're obviously going into hibernation. And then when the weather conditions get better, they can come out of hibernation. There's more food available for them and their metabolism will then increase. Now, interdependence. So interdependence refers to when two organisms depend on each other for survival. And it's a two-way process. So what's really important about this is if an exam question ever come up on interdependence and given an example of interdependence, you have to give both sides of the story. So this example down here, it's not just enough to say that bees rely on plants for pollen to make honey. What are the plants actually getting out of the bees as well? So the plants need the bees to transfer the pollen to other plants so that they can reproduce. So you can't stop there by just saying bees rely on plants for pollen to make honey. 
give the second side of the story there as well. The plants need the bees to transfer some pollen to other plants so that they can reproduce. So just keep that in mind for interdependence. Really important that you give both sides of the story. Now, competition is one of the last things we're going to be looking at today. So competition is the struggle between organisms for things in short supply. So what kind of things are going to be in short supply and they'll have to compete for? Well, food, water, mates, oxygen and light. Particularly important, those last two there for plants. So it can take place between different species, but also between organisms from the same species. So for example, male deer are going to compete for mates and plants are going to compete for light and space. So we can see that happening in the images over here. So they're competing most likely for a mate. The plants are competing for light. So you can see they're all going to grow towards the light and try and take up as much space as possible so they can absorb as much light as possible to get um, as much food produced in photosynthesis. Now, population control. So a population comprises of all the members of a species and there are a number of factors that can control the size of a population. So we've mentioned this already, but competition can control the size of a population. Predation, parasitism and symbiosis. All of those can control the number of species living in a particular area. So the two types of competition we have are contest competition and scramble competition. So within contest competition, there is an active physical struggle between two or more organisms. Okay, for a resource that's in short supply. And we can see that in the diagram over here. We can see there is an active physical struggle happening. But down here, when we look at the cows, there is no active physical struggle because that's scramble competition. Everybody is scrambling for resources, but all of the competing individuals are going to get some of the resources. Some are going to get more than others. Some are going to get less than others, but everybody is going to get something. So contest competition, they're competing, there's an active physical struggle. Scramble competition, everybody is going to get something. And this is exactly what's happening here. So what do ecologists mean by the term scramble competition? So this is where all individuals get some of the resource. Give one example of a factor other than light, which may be a source of competition among plants. So for this one, we could say space. You could say water. Minerals would be another example there. So lots of different potential answers. Give one example of a factor other than food, which may be a source of competition among animals. So we could have mates. Again, we could have water, shelter, even some territory. Okay, all possible answers there for the animals. And caterpillars have mouth parts that are suitable for chewing on leaves, whereas the adult form, the butterfly, has long suck sucking mouth parts. Suggesting so having different types of mouth parts reduces competition between the adults and the young of such species. So what we can say there is they have different food. So there's going to be less competition. So obviously if they're eating different things, there's going to be less competition. So different food leads to less competition. So they don't have to compete as much as they might have as if they were eating the same thing. Now, predation. Predation is the catching, killing, and eating of another organism. So the predator is the one that catches, kills, and eats another organism, which is the prey. And the prey is the organism that is caught, kills, and eaten by the predator. So in this particular example over here, the predator is the bear, and down here, the prey is the fish. So some examples would include ladybirds and aphids, so ladybirds being the predator, blackbirds and earthworms, again, the blackbird being the predator, and hawks and mice, this time the mice is going to be the prey, the hawk is going to be the predator. Parasitism we've already mentioned in terms of the pyramid of numbers before, but parasitism occurs when two organisms of different species live in close association, and one organism is going to obtain its food to the disadvantage of the other. Okay, So the parasite is going to live on a living individual, it has a living host, and it's going to be the detriment or to the disadvantage of the actual host. So the parasite is always going to be the one that benefits and the host, which is the one, the living one, um, that is supplying the food source to the parasite is the one that's going to face the disadvantage. And then finally for today, symbiosis. So symbiosis occurs when two organisms of different species live in close association with each other and at least one benefits. But in contrast to parasitism, nobody becomes disadvantaged. So some examples, bacteria in our intestine um, will produce vitamins for us and they also get shelter for themselves. So in this case, both of us are actually getting an advantage there. 
and then nitrogen fixing bacteria in plants will get food and shelter from the plant but in turn will provide nitrates for the plant. So again, there's an advantage there for both of them. There's benefits for both. Neither is becoming disadvantaged, which is the case for parasitism, where at least one or one of them is going to become disadvantaged. So just to finish up today, I'm just going to quickly talk you through the exam revision website and tell you about all of the resources which are available to you, not just for biology, but for other leaving cert subjects as well. So first of all, if you look at the subjects which are available, So we can see there, we have um, Leave Insert Ag Science, Biology, Business, Chemistry, Economics, English, French, Geography, History, Irish, Maths, Music and Physics. And within each one, we're going to have the exact same features. So we have video tutorials, we have quizzes, presentations, an exam builder and a resource pack. So if we wanted to watch some video tutorials on what we did today, we go to Unit 1, Ecology, and we can see there all of the different videos which are available for you to watch. So if we wanted to watch a little bit more about the energy flow, we click in, the video will appear there for you to watch, learning intentions will be given, and if you wanted to watch it a little bit quickly, you can um, change the speed up as far as two times speed as well. Now, when we go back, once you've watched all the videos on a particular topic, you can test yourself in a quiz. They're all MCQ, multiple choice. You can do them as many times as you want until you get 100%, just to make sure you're fully comfortable with the content that's involved. And right down at the bottom as well, we also have a resource pack. So for ecology, we have 11 pages of H1 notes there, all of the material which you need to know fully tailored to the exam will be available not just for ecology but for every topic in Leave Insert Biology. We do have an exam builder as well so all of the Leave Insert exam questions and mock questions will be available here. So we can see here there's a 2021 question, we have another 2021 one there. So we press the plus one to add it to our exam and once you go back up to the top you can download the questions and download the answers. Now, if you want to find out a little bit more, just go to the exam revision website, examrevision.ie. There is a free trial there as well. And right down the bottom, you'll be able to find out a little bit more about the plans and the pricing. So if you did want to find out um, what price was involved, you'll be able to find that there. There is now a monthly subscription as well, so you don't have to pay for a full year in advance. You can just pay as you go and pay as you need. And the more subjects that you um, subscribe for, the cheaper it is. So there's a discount for any additional subject which you might add. So keep an eye on our YouTube channel and all our social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. We will be advertising lots more Saturday sessions over the next little while. So make sure and set a reminder for every Saturday at 12. And I hope to see you again soon.